Good evening. It is certainly a um, privilege and blessing to be here. Uh, thank you all for uh, taking the time. Uh, Luke chapter 17. Uh, thank you, Dr. Johnson, for that wonderful introduction that I gave you, by the way. Amen. Um, and for you who are here by choice or force, amen, we thank God for you. Um, Luke 17, I want to talk about the priority of worship, the priority of worship. It is interesting um, that it is very easy for us uh, to get consumed with the busyness of life. Uh, I can recall even in my prayer time, um, there are moments where mid-prayer, uh, my mind moves and I'm all of a sudden thinking about the schedule for the kids. Uh, last week I was uh, praying in the middle of the prayer. I'm like, did I take the meat out of the freezer? I know I got to cook this. You know, just, just stuff. And it's so easy to get consumed, even in seminary. As we work through the text, uh, we uh, cannot trick ourselves. There's a difference between really engaging the scripture in devotion and academic pursuit. And sometimes in our busyness, uh, we try to put those things together, and it doesn't always work that well. So tonight, I just want to talk about the priority of worship, Luke 17, at verse 11. Uh, there are a few things there I think will help us this evening, and I'll read uh, starting at verse 11. While he was on his way <clears throat> to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. They raised their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourself to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him that he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed, but the nine, were they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? Verse 19. And he said to him, stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. The priority of worship. This familiar passage of scripture where we find Jesus as he is moving towards Jerusalem. Uh, back in Luke chapter 9, we see this moment where the text reminds us that he had set his face towards Jerusalem, that he was determined to get there, for he knew uh, that the Son of Man had to experience many things, and he had to ascend. We're reminded in Luke chapter 13 that he did not want to die outside of Jerusalem. So here it is. He's on a pathway to get to where he needs to go. We stop by Luke 17 to see this story where he is moving, and as he is moving, he arrives on this path between these Samaritans and these Jews. And we know the history of this relationship, contention, um, oil and water, if you will. While they both had a respect for the first five books of what we know as the Old Testament, and they both believed in one God, their orthodoxy and orthopraxy differed. And here it is, Jesus is moving towards Jerusalem, and as he's moving, uh, we, we see these two groups, a group of people who normally don't hang out with each other. But again, as oil and water, as we learned in our grade school science project, while it, don't, it doesn't mix, there is a place, if you place it in a vase, where it will touch. And that place where it touches is where Jesus is walking, right here on the outskirts of communities, where these two groups of people who otherwise would not hang out with each other find a common place. A common place because, as the, as the text tells us, they have leprosy. Both groups of people who have been banished from their communities can find a common place in a difficult situation. And here they are. And Jesus is walking towards Jerusalem. And as they see him, they cry out, Master. Uh, as we progress in the text, there are at least three things that I would say are very positive as it relates to how they respond to seeing Jesus. 
Here it is. Jesus is coming and these men who have been banished from their communities, maybe they had families, it didn't matter, you had to go here. Maybe they had business, maybe they were very productive, it didn't matter. You could no longer hang out in community. You were banished to the outskirts of society and here, oil and water, see Jesus. It's at this moment that they call him master. The beautiful part about this is that there was enough in them in the midst of their despair to see the authority of Jesus. Hope is in front of them. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 5 that there was another moment when Jesus healed a man of leprosy. If you recall in that text, there was a moment where this man said to Jesus, if you are willing, will you heal me? The Bible tells us that he did that immediately and even though he suggested that he should not tell that to anyone, he told everybody he could. The news about Jesus had spread, and so it is certain that these men were aware that Jesus was bringing with them hope. Could you imagine for a moment being in that context on the outskirts of society with this disease that not only affects your physical, but it impacts you socially and Some would suggest to you that it has something to do with your relationship with God. We are reminded of Naaman, even in 2 Kings, who was a man of stature, of wealth, a leader in the army. But the text says, but he had leprosy, which reminds us that no matter what your socioeconomic status, this particular situation made you an outcast. And here it is in the midst of their distress, they see Jesus. How often in the midst of your own distress are you reminded of the hope that is in our Lord? Here it is, a beautiful part of this interaction is that they see hope in Jesus and they call him master, not simply calling him out of despair, but recognizing that he has real authority. Master, they say in the text, have mercy on us. Here it is, the content of their petition. The first thing that we see here is that they have hope. The very fact that they called him master suggested that they knew he had authority. And then the content of the petition was, have mercy on us. That is, that we are not asking something of you based on merit. We are completely submitted to your mercy. A good reminder that this is a second good thing about this text, that when we approach the Lord, we don't come to him as if we are do something but we come to him as those submitted to his mercy. Lord, show compassion, reminding us even of Luke 5 with that other man when he said, if it is your will. That's how we come to the Lord. Lord, if you are willing, I'm willing to believe that some of us have been in seasons of distress. Maybe you didn't have leprosy, but you had something. I'm willing to believe that sometimes in life we feel that we are not due that circumstance or at least not for that long. But the proper approach that these reveal to us is that we come to him submitted to his mercy. Here are the good things so far in this text, that they had hope. It's good to know that we have a God, we serve a Lord of authority. It's a good thing to come asking for his mercy. Uh, Verse 14 says, when he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they were going, here's that third positive part of the text. The Bible says that as they were going, they were healed. They were cleansed. Now, we understand that this call that Jesus had to these men to go to the priest is a very important moment in the text. For we understand that the priest did not provide a remedy. The priest would examine. The priest would simply look at a person who had been banished to the outskirts of the city and take an evaluation to determine whether or not the leprosy was fading or if it had continued. And here it is, Jesus is saying to these men who are in this very difficult situation, go see the priest. And I like to think that if I were them, that I would be as excited. Honestly, I might be thinking to myself, well, I heard Jesus about the other guy. And when he had leprosy, you healed him immediately. And now you're sending us to a priest who, by the way, doesn't have a remedy, will only make an examination, and if we still have leprosy, then it seems that this journey would be for no cause. But here it is. The Bible shows us another proper way to respond to the Lord uh, as they were going. In other words, uh, the very voice of the Lord was sufficient for them to move. This is faith walking. The beautiful part of the text is that we get to see men of hope. We get to see men who depend on the mercies of our Lord and those who are willing to move by faith. And so the text tells us 
that as they were going, they were cleansed. Verse 15 says again, now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back. Here it is. Here is where we find this place of putting priority on worship. The Bible says that only one of this 10, when he saw that he was healed, remember the priest would make examination, but give no remedy. And on the way there, one looked at himself. I said, I'm healed. Like, how exciting is that? I'm healed. All 10 of them, but only one said, no, I need to go back. I need to go back. And the text tells us to glorify God with a loud voice. And here it is, a, a picture and the appropriate human response to a magnificent God. Verse 16, and he fell on his face at his feet. You want to talk about worship. You, you want to talk about a person or a group of people who are heading towards the priest. And one of them came back and said, you know what? This is a perfect opportunity to worship. Now, to be fair, the other nine, maybe you can relate to this. If I have been a person that's been uh, uh, outside of the city, I I'm dealing with leprosy, my, my, my clothes are torn, uh, my, my flesh is showing, my head is bald, all the things associated with it. I would be excited to find out that I have been healed and be ready to get back to the city and be ready to get back with my family and be ready to get back to do business, whatever thing that I was doing prior to being placed in this spot. And so we can relate to this idea of going on to the next thing, anticipating the moment to see your family again. I'm pretty sure many of us would rush and want to hurry to the priest. The question that I have to ask myself, the question that I present to you today is, how often have you been the nine as opposed to the one? How often have we been consumed with getting to the next thing that we fail to turn back and go to the feet of our Lord and worship? And here it is in this beautiful moment, we get to see this one which reminds us of the priority of worship. Because the reality is, even when you get to the priest, it's not as if the priest is going to do an evaluation and say, OK, you're good. Back to the city. No, there is a ceremony that must be performed. It's going to take some time before you can reengage society. And here it is in this text that we get to see this one Samaritan say, rather than engage in the ceremony, let me express a true moment of heartfelt worship. Which reminds us that before there's good liturgy or religious services or ceremonies, there ought to be a place of genuine worship from the heart. And here it is. The priority of worship is revealed in this one man who is a Samaritan. And Jesus, upon seeing this, said in verse 17 again, were there not 10 cleansed? Like where, where is the community of worshipers? Where are the where is the multitude of individuals who have come to me for with hope, depended on my mercy, walked by faith, experienced this healing, but only one came back to to worship. Where are the ten? But the nine worthy. Where where are the ungrateful ones? Have you ever been here? Assuming that what the Lord has given was owed to you. In the busyness of our lives, we tend to pick this up at times. And there's one who came back to worship, but where are the nine? Was there no one found to return to give glory to God except this foreigner? A beautiful thing that the Samaritan was the one to come back. It reminds us that it's not based on person, that this uh, thing that has happened is not based on person. In fact, the person who came back to, to worship was one who would have been considered an enemy of the Jews, in a sense. It's not even based on the fact that they were healed. In fact, the text says it like this. And he said to him again in verse 19, stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. Not the fact that the leprosy is gone. Your faith has made you well. This picture of a person who put a priority on worship. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we do the same thing? 
Uh, do we prioritize genuine heartfelt worship that falling on our face at the feet of Jesus before everything else that we do? Uh, there's a gentleman at our church who a few weeks ago asked me a question that many people ask. I've asked myself and I've asked others. And he said, how can I spend more time in my word? How can I spend more time in my devotions and prayer, all these things? And he began to lay out a litany of things that he's tried in the past. He said, I tried to journal. I tried this. I tried that. It didn't work. How can I spend more time before the Lord? And as he laid out some things and I was thinking about the response, I simply said to him, won't you just set your alarm? Like, set the alarm to remind you to get in your word and do your devotions. And I could tell when I said that, that he was expecting something more spiritual than that. And that's the best I had. I said, yeah, just try it, you know, set your alarm and it'll remind you. And so a few weeks pass, he comes back to church and I says, how's it been going? And he says, man, it's been going great. He says, man, when you first told me, I'm like, set your alarm, I'm coming to the past. I thought you had some spiritual stuff. I'm like, oh, set your alarm. And he says, but it's working well. He says, and I set my alarm at various times throughout my week. I'm a very busy person. And he said, the reason why it works so well for me is that when I set my alarm, it forces me to make a decision. Because when the alarm goes off and it's time for me to get into whatever I need to get into my devotions, my time before the Lord, and I'm busy, I have a decision to make. Either I can dismiss it or I can allow that moment that I know that I need to get in front of the Lord to interrupt my agenda. And that's all we're talking about tonight. Are we willing to let God interrupt the busyness of our lives? Is there a moment in your life where you've taken uh, your agenda and, and just set it aside? I know some of us know how to multitask. Some of us plan everything, even restroom breaks. But is there a moment that you've taken your agenda and all your plans and all your ability to multitask and just set that aside for a moment and just got down before the Lord? Is, is, is God able to interrupt the busyness of your life? When you think about the text, you are reminded that Jesus was busy, too, that he had set his face towards Jerusalem, that he was going because he knew the son of man had to experience many things and he was on his way there. But he was not too busy that he could not stop by to be hope for a group of people, to show mercy for a group of people, to allow them to walk out on faith and participate in worship. Imagine for a moment if Jesus was too busy for us. But on regular occasion, he makes time. And I'm believing that you know that to be true in your life. And is your life set up in such a way that he can interrupt? Even in the midst of your studies, when we try to replace worship with academic pursuit, are you willing to look at the same verses, not with an eye for graded papers, but with an eye that said, Lord, let me just lay at your feet. Do we have a priority of worship? If you don't, I pray that you, you get there. Let us pray, Father. Thank you for a simple reminder that as we have uh, things to do, an agenda, work, family, stuff, class, room, things, uh, let us put a priority on you. Let us not lose that moment to turn back. For if we look back over our lives, I'm willing to believe there are a lot of moments where we look like the other nine, where we're just ready to get to the next thing. I'm ready to move to the next place. Let us pause in the busyness of our lives and turn back to you and fall at your feet in worship. For that is the appropriate response for a person who has been transformed in you. So God, we thank you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.